Today's video is brought to you by The Ridge. The Ridge makes awesome wallets, backpacks, phone cases, and other gear. Their stuff makes for great holiday gifts because they are practical and useful. They are awesome for people who are hard to shop for. Who wouldn't appreciate an awesome wallet that is easy to carry in any pocket? You can even find a unique design to match their personality. Some of their designs are subtle and classic. They also have some wild and fun ones and everything in between. I have three different Ridge wallets and I love them. And I'm not the only one who loves my Ridge wallet. They have over 30,000 five star reviews. Right now, the Ridge is offering criminally listed viewers 10% off with free worldwide shipping and returns. Just go to ridge.com slash listed, that's ridge.com slash listed, and use the promo code listed at the checkout. Buy someone special the best wallet they'll ever own and help support criminally listed by checking out ridge.com slash listed. Number 3. Martin Toland On the night of September 7, 2007, 28-year-old Alan Nolan of Dublin, Ireland had two friends over, 28-year-old James Carroll and 32-year-old Martin Toland. They spent the night doing ecstasy, playing poker, and playing video games. Starting around 5 a.m., Nolan started getting some prank phone calls. Anytime he answered the phone, the caller would hang up. Nolan asked Tolan if his sister might be the one making the prank phone calls. Nolan's sister and Tolan's sister had been friends, but they had a falling out recently. After they stopped being friends, Nolan's sister started getting phone calls from someone who would hang up whenever she answered. Also, taxis would come to her home saying they had been called, and food she didn't order would be delivered to her home. Nolan said he thought that Tolan's sister might be the one calling him that morning. This led to a physical fight between Nolan and Tolan. It was broken up and Tolan was told to leave. Minutes later, 28-year-old James Carroll called the emergency line. He and 28-year-old Alan Nolan were rushed to the hospital. Carol had been stabbed twice, including once in the heart. Nolan had also been stabbed in the heart, but he had been stabbed five times. Carol survived his injuries thanks to emergency surgery. 28-year-old Al Nolan did not survive. The stab to the heart proved to be fatal. Martin Nolan was arrested shortly after the attack. He claimed that he had acted in self-defense. Tolan said that Nolan talked about shooting whoever was making the prank phone calls. He claimed that Nolan pulled out a knife and came towards him. He said that Carol also advanced on him. Tolan told the police that they got stabbed because he was defending himself. James Carroll had a different story. He said that Nolan had kicked Tolan out of his home after the fight about the prank phone calls. Carol explained that Tolan was at the door and he was standing between him and Nolan. Then Nolan yelled something and Tolan flew into a rage. Carol said that Tolan stabbed him while he was trying to attack Nolan. Murren Tolan went to trial in January 2010. At the trial, James Carroll testified. Carroll admitted that he was the one who made the prank phone calls that morning. Martin Tolan was found guilty of murder and recklessly or intentionally causing serious injury for stabbing Carroll. He was sentenced to life in prison. Tolan's lawyer appealed. In October 2011, the Court of Appeals quashed the conviction because the judge had not given proper instructions to the jury. Martin Tolan went to trial again in May 2012. This time, the jury found him guilty of manslaughter. The jury considered it manslaughter 
because Nolan had taunted him before the deadly attack. Martin Tolan was sentenced to nine years of prison, but he only ended up serving five years. He was released in April 2017. The friends and family of Al Nolan were distraught that Tolan received such a light sentence. They feel that he essentially got away with murder. Number 2. Andrew Loban In June 2013, Andrew Loban was 31 years old and he lived in Ocala, Florida. He was the father of three. He worked downtown at a bar as a bouncer. On the night of June 2nd, 2013, Loban went out to a bar with some co-workers. It was not the bar where they worked. With them that night were 23-year-old Benjamin Howard, 20-year-old Jerry Bynes Jr., and 25-year-old Josue Santiago. Howard had served in the National Guard for six years. He also served in the Army for nine months, and he had been stationed for six months in Kuwait. He had been involved in 66 combat missions. Two days earlier, he had been honorably discharged from the Army. Jerry Bynes Jr. was a mixed martial arts fighter, and he was undefeated. He had a son and a daughter. He was engaged to be married to the sister of Santiago. At about 12.43 a.m., the men left the bar and they were standing on the sidewalk. Suddenly, 31-year-old Andrew Loban pulled out a handgun and put it next to the head of 25-year-old Josue Santiago and then he pulled the trigger. The bullet exited out of the left side of Santiago's head. What happened next isn't clear. Loban either shot 20-year-old Jerry Bynes Jr. or the bullet traveled through Santiago's head and hit Bynes in the neck. What is known is that Loban turned the gun on 23-year-old Benjamin Howard and shot him in the forehead. Two of the men died on the sidewalk. One of them was taken to the hospital, but sadly, he was pronounced dead hours later. About three hours after the shooting, Andrew Loban was arrested at his girlfriend's home. He admitted to killing his friends, and he expected to pay the price for his crimes with his life. Loban was asked why he did it. He said that it all started with a prank. A few weeks earlier, he had gone to the shooting range with Santiago. He was sure that Santiago did something to his gun to mess with him because it misfired. Santiago recorded the misfire. Santiago then showed the video of him being pranked to Howard and Bynes. Loban said that Howard and Bynes laughed at him and teased him. Loban said that he was humiliated and he planned on just killing Santiago. But then things got off hand and he ended up murdering all three men. For the mass murder, the district attorney Juan Lobin to be sentenced to death. But in December 2014, the DA accepted a plea deal. Lobin pleaded guilty and he was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Andrew Lobin is serving his sentence in the DeSoto Annex in Arcadia, Florida. Number 1. Shauna Howe In the early 1990s, Oil City, Pennsylvania had a population of around 11,000 people. It was a quiet town where people didn't lock their doors. 11-year-old Shauna Howe lived in the town with her family. After attending school on October 27, 1992, Shauna got dressed in her Halloween costume. That Halloween, she was a gymnast, so she was wearing a black and turquoise jumpsuit. Shauna went with her Girl Scout group to her retirement home where they sang songs. 
Then they went to a nearby church for a Halloween party. The party ended at around 8 p.m. Shauna then started walking home alone. When she didn't arrive home, her mother began to panic. Shauna's family searched the neighborhood, but the 11 year old was nowhere to be found. Shauna was reported missing at 10 p.m. A witness came forward and he said that he saw Shauna walking home. He said that a tall, unkept man had forced her to get into a rust colored car. Shauna's family was heavily involved in the search. Two days after she went missing, Shauna's uncle found the jumpsuit six miles from where she was last seen. It was found near a remote swimming hole in the next town. That area was searched. The next day, the body of 11-year-old Shauna Howe was found a few hundred yards from where the jumpsuit was found. It was in a boulder filled canyon under an unused 30 foot tall railroad trestle. The cause of death was extensive blunt force trauma. She had multiple lacerations, contusions, and fractured ribs. She had most likely been thrown from the trestle alive. She may have lived up to half an hour after being thrown off the trestle. She had also been sexually assaulted. The murder shocked the residents of the small town. People only became more frightened when no arrests were made in the wake of the murder. Shauna's body was found the day before Halloween. City officials decided to hold trick-or-treating for a few hours during daylight hours. The town continued to have trick-or-treating only during daylight hours for years. Oil City became known as the town that outlawed Halloween. For years, there were no breaks in the case. Then, on October 28, 1997, five years and one day after Shauna was kidnapped and murdered, another girl in Oil City went missing. Four-year-old Sheenie Freeman was last seen playing near her home when she went missing. A search was conducted. One of the searchers was 17-year-old Nicholas Brown. He gave Sheenie's mom a hug to comfort her. The police didn't say why, but they began to suspect that Brown knew something about Sheenie's whereabouts. He was confronted and he led the investigators to her body. He had thrown her off a cliff into a wooded area. Her body was recovered and Brown was arrested. Brown said that he became mad at Sheenie because she threw a stick at him. Brown said he flew into a rage and then pushed her over the cliff because he thought he had killed her. An autopsy revealed that Sheeny had been sexually assaulted, strangled, and being so bad that her skull was broken. The residents of Oil City immediately thought of Shauna's murder when they heard about Sheeny being killed. But the police were able to confirm that Brown, who had been 12 at the time, had nothing to do with Shauna's murder. Nicholas Brown pleaded guilty and in October 1998, he was sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. For years, the police continued to follow up on leads regarding Shauna's murder. Then in early 2002, a decade after the murder, the police got a huge break. Male DNA had been found on Shauna's jumpsuit and a match had been found. The DNA belonged to a 30-year-old man named James O'Brien. James O'Brien had been a resident of Oil City. But when his DNA was linked to Shauna's murder, he was serving a four and a half year to 20 year sentence at the State Correctional Institution Mercer in Mercer, Pennsylvania. On June 30th, 1995, James had followed a woman home from a bar. 
He alerted her out to his car and tried to force her to get into the trunk. James managed to get her on the ground and he tried to knock her out by hitting her head against the cement. A car came by and it spooked James. He ended up fleeing the scene but he was arrested a short time later. James was convicted of attempted kidnapping in February 2006. James O'Brien had not been a suspect in Shauna's murder until it was determined that his DNA was on the jumpsuit. The police then talked to a close friend of James, Eldred Walker. Walker told the police a disturbing story. Walker explained that he was friends with James and his brother Timothy O'Brien. In 1992, Eldred was 33, James was 20, and Timothy was 25. In the weeks leading up to Halloween, Walker said he came up with a prank. He suggested kidnapping a boy who was friends with his son on Halloween night. The brothers readily agreed to the plan. The plan was to keep the boy captive for 15 or 20 minutes and then drop him off near his home. The motivation behind the prank was to make the Oil City Police Department look stupid. Over the weeks, the plan evolved. They thought it would be better to kidnap a girl because it would get more media attention and the police might take it more seriously. Walker said that on the night of October 27, 1992, he caught up with Brian and Timothy. They told him they were going ahead with a prank that night. Then they spotted Shauna walking home. Walker said that Timothy told him to go grab her. Walker said that he walked up to Shauna and started asking her about Girl Guy cookies. He then grabbed Shauna and handed her off to Timothy who put her in the car. Walker said that Timothy and James drove off in their own car with Shauna in it. Walker then got into his car and he went home. Walker said he assumed it was still a prank and they would release her shortly. But then later that night, the O'Brien brothers came to his home and they had Shauna with them. They took Shauna upstairs to a bedroom. Walker said they heard Shauna yelling to leave her alone and not to touch her. Walker said he went up to the bedroom and told James and Timothy to let her go. Walker said he then left the home. When he came back an hour later, Timothy, James, and Shauna were all gone. Timothy O'Brien had also served time in prison. The police talked to one of his old cellmates. The cellmate said that Timothy had confessed to him that he and his brother had killed Shauna. Eldred Walker made a plea deal. In exchange for testifying against the O'Brien brothers, he was able to plead guilty to third degree murder and kidnapping. He was sentenced to 20 to 40 years in prison. The O'Briens went to trial in October 2007. The trial lasted two weeks and the jury deliberated for 16 hours over two days. They reached their verdict a day shy of the 13th anniversary of Shauna's murder. The brothers were convicted of second degree murder, third degree murder, and kidnapping. They were acquitted of first degree murder and rape. They were sentenced to life without the chance of parole. In 2010, Oil City allowed trick or treating after dark for the first time in 16 years. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Recently, we launched a podcast called Into the Killing. In each episode, we examine a cold case that was solved years later. In our latest episode, we take a look at the haunting murder of a young girl and a tragic miscarriage of justice. Into the Killing is available on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, 
and anywhere you find your favorite podcasts. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.